cover this thing. The birds have been using it as a latrine. This is the 3.5 litre Rover V8, not the original engine that was in the Series 1. However, it was the engine that was in it when we received it. I suspect this engine was built sometime in the early to mid 80s and was poached out of one of Rover's luxury vehicles, possibly the SD1. The cheapest option for me would be to rebuild the V8 and throw it back in the truck but it's far too powerful for my needs and it's only gonna break the gearbox again, so I don't wanna use it. However, I'm not exactly swimming in options. So I found a fellow in Virginia by the name of Davis, and what he does is rebuilds four cylinder GM motors that are essentially a plug and play option for series Land Rovers. So you end up with a zippier engine with far less pony power than this big lump right here. Now I contacted Mr. Davis and he did tell me there was a line up in front and it would take some time for this engine to be built and for me to receive it. But I felt very positive about the whole project, paid him in full and said, build me that engine, I want it. Now the deal we made was very much like the old fashioned handshake over the telephone, leaving me with little to no recourse if the deal went south. But like I said, I had a good vibe about the fellow and really, what could go wrong? As far as waiting, I still had a gearbox to repair and a bulkhead to rebuild and they're very intimidating tasks for a rookie. And as the months literally rolled in the years, I had many pleasant conversations with him, usually revolving around how much closer he was getting to building this engine. But by the time those projects were done, I found myself waiting. And by June of 2023, I called Mr. Davis and I said, perhaps you are too busy. Maybe I'll just take my money back, cancel the order and let you off the hook. He said, you could do that, but I am starting your engine this very weekend. I said, that's great. I said, when shall I call you back? And he said, July. So by mid July, when I called him back, crickets. There was nobody answering the phone, nobody returning messages. And it's about that time when even a man of such faith as myself feels cracks in the armor. Maybe it was just not meant to be, but don't you worry. Everyone I've told this story to has the same expression on their face, their eyes bulging wide, the mouth slightly open, wondering how anybody could be so stupid, but I get you. I'd even written up a rather long list of hilariously funny self-defecating gags to be used at my own expense, but as most of them involved sodomy and sand, I figured they were probably inappropriate for this family-friendly production. Needs to be said, at the time of filming of December 2023, Mr. has answered the phone, told me that the engine is built, needs to go through a running in process and be ready for shipping come January 2024. We shall see, but we need to wind it back. We need to rewind back to my time of wallowing in my own despair. When we made Andy down the road, who's my chief consultant and fellow series one restorer, put me onto a company called ACR, which is Automotive Component Remanufacture in the UK. And one of the many things they do is rebuild Rover engines and you can get a standard variety or a souped up variety. But as I'm trying to stay away from extra pony power, I went for the standard. So it is that three months from order, a big crate turned up in the driveway. And now that big crate is sitting right over there.
by my reckoning we have uh, two engine mounts and the larger of the two is gonna go on the passenger side. Okay. Find out if I'm wrong, won't we? Put on some of this blue stuff. So they don't drop off. Now it's time to turn our attention to the transmission and Roland, my engine builder, was kind enough for a reasonable price to throw in this secondary bell housing into the package because if we line it up with the original, you'll see a problem straight away. Stud patterns are different. So this original one lines up to a two litre engine where the new one lines up to the upgraded 2.25 litre engine. And this may come off an early series two because in addition to the differing stud patterns, we also have the hole still there for the mechanical shaft driven clutch, but also the lay shaft bearing is the same as the original. For later on, Land Rover beefed it up a bit and, and that changed. However, despite all of our hard work, we're gonna have to go through, swap it out. See if we can get this uh, big lump into position. trick for me in the end was to have the back of the engine jacked up so you could bring the gearbox down into it and not just for the effects of gravity but also because that handbrake relay was blocking my approach so uh, that's what worked in the end I'll know next time a bit of tension on these bolts so things don't fall bits for mounting the gearbox, we have a rather convoluted system here of rubbers and spacers and washers and so forth. 
what I have done is I've ordered some more modern ones like from the Series 3s, the mounting brackets and some angle adapters so you can use the same engine mounts on the gearbox, but as they have not arrived, we're gonna, we're gonna deal with what we've got. All right, I'm just bluffing my way through this. How I think it works is we're gonna put this plate on first, like such. And the skinny part of this rubber here will go down and fit into that hole over top of that spacer. And then with our bolt, we have the rubber washer with a steel washer on top. And we'll shove that in. And once it's through, we'll lock it in from underneath. prop shafts. As we know, these objects come in two pieces joined together with a splined sleeve closer to one end than it is to the other that allows the object to elongate and contract. I don't know where it came from, I was under the belief that the way they're installed is the splined sleeves go closer to the gearbox and that's reinforced by the green bible. As you can see here, Secure the propeller shaft sleeve end of the transfer box output flange. So in other words, the rear one will be facing like this on the truck and the front one will be facing like that. However, the Haynes manual for the Series 2s and 3s says something different. As you can see there on the illustration, it shows quite clearly the spline sleeve for the rear prop shaft is facing the transfer box. However, it carries on forward where the front one has a spline sleeve towards the axle. And we made Andy down the road with a Series 1. On his, he has both the spline sleeves facing the axles. So as we consulted upon this dilemma, the question arose, does it really matter? I don't know. So I need to choose one. I'll stick with the green Bible and install the splines towards the gearbox. See how the truck runs. to confess to flipping the script on myself. You can see this grease nipple right there. It's uh, a lot more easier access if I have the spline down this direction. So I'm following the Haynes manual. Yep, I think that's more better. Well, that's uh, very much enjoyed my workstation bench that I created. Oh, it's in the way.
little clevis pin here that there's a strong spring on it not only needs to be pushed in but screwed in as well and there's no room there's no room to work all right the trick here is to get a bar behind the clevis to make room for the spring and then in the tight confines we can use a coin as a screwdriver just to get the thread started finish that off with a wrench Clevis that runs between the handbrake lever and the relay, that's far more obliging. There's a, there's a lot of room to work. We have our clutch in the resting position. It's up against its lock nut right there. Now if I push it, you'll see how it levers the relay, but also on the other side, you'll see that pin with the hole in it moving. Now we have a two piece clutch shaft with its little gears here and it's got splines in the coupling. Now we can see the hole and that pin there roughly lines up with the hole on the input for the bell housing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna line those two holes up on the shaft like such, and this will slide in and out to allow us to fit. And then we're gonna pop it in there, drag the coupling over there, lock it into place. All right, to test this, we're gonna need a gear shifter. Now I ordered a gasket and a cover plate for the top of the bell housing where the shifter lives. And I received instead two gaskets. So a bit of sheet metal, built my own. We're gonna try fourth gear, high range. Right, are you comfortable? Not particularly. <laughs> All right. Put on the clutch. And in. Yep. Oh! Stop working! Did you remove the block that was under the wheel? Oh, shit. That might do it. All right, foot in. Yep. And put off. Oh, we're in gear. And on. Oh, we've got a victory. Oh, a victory. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. I think that's good. So as you can see, this project's come along very quickly and we can see light at the end of the tunnel. But just like a horse bolting for home, we'll have that urgency to rush. And we don't want to make stupid mistakes. The last thing I want to do is start up this engine and not have any oil in it. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to be using the Castrol GTX 10 weight by 40, which my engine builder Roland says is an excellent choice. And the Haynes manual also says I'm a bloody good bloke for my choice in oils. Good. 
Alright, well we're still a litre short from the recommended dose. I'm just reading full on the dipstick, so that should keep us out of trouble. And we'll uh, monitor that situation as, uh, as the time approaches. Now moving to our uh, transmission side of things, our, both of our uh, Series 1 and 2 and 3 manuals, they say one and a half litres for the gearbox. Got my special measuring jug. Another bonus about doing this too is that I find out if there's any nasty leaks while I can still do something about it. Okay, and then for the transfer box, they'll be asking for a little more, two and a half litres. I think we're talking metric. Punishable offence around these parts. Now you may notice that I'm using this very syrupy 140 weight gearbox oil, which is not my intention. I made a mistake in the purchase. However, it's all I have in the shop, so I'm putting it in. It does say on the back of the pack that it's suitable for such applications, but I do think the viscosity is a bit too, you know, viscous. So it's safe there for the moment, but at some stage, I think we're gonna drop and swap. If somebody does have a different idea on said product, then I'm all ears. Well, it is looking good, but we do have a few puzzles that we have to sort out before we can really advance. One of those is where we're gonna put the fuse box. Now that should alert some viewers that there is skullduggery afoot. Second, we need to connect the accelerator linkage to the throttle linkage on the carburetor. Then also we have to work out how we're going to filter the air on said carburetor. And finally, what and how we're going to install a radiator. And for that we need to assess our real estate. We need an engine bay. So that's what our next film is going to be all about. Bodybuilding. Nothing to do with lifting heavy weights in a repetitive fashion, but putting all the panels back on the truck. In fact, the very opposite to what we did in part two, the strip down. In fact, I was somewhat tempted just to play that video in reverse with some cunning commentary and just cheat. But we are going to run into some problems and they will need to be addressed.